Thank you very much, uh, Ida, and also thank you very much, Professor Reynolds, for your very gracious talk about uh, the Quran. Um, I'm going to uh, speak about my uh, personal encounter with the, uh, with the whole of the Bible, um, and then narrow my focus to um, what I've actually learned from reading uh, the New Testament and particularly reading uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And then I'll end with a few comments about how Muslims and Christians can learn from each other mutually as they read each other's scriptures. For me, the most uh, striking thing about the, uh, the Bible is that it is not only revelation, which is what a Muslim reader expects, using the model of the Quran. The Bible is not only revelation, but it contains theology. And I think that I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean by that. And I think this probably explains the underlying differences in the models of revelation. It's a puzzle that comes up persistently in uh, Christian Muslim relations, that the notion of revelation in Christianity is more to do with relationship with the personality of Christ, uh, to do with the experience of faith, whereas the Quranic revelation seems propositional and more literary. Um, and I think that the fact that the Bible, both Testaments, contain theology and not merely revelation is the main key to understanding this thing. Let me give you a couple of examples that are of interest to me both in the context of my work on the New Testament and also more broadly. The first of this is the problem of innocent suffering um, and the theology that is implicit in that, the problem of innocent suffering. The seminal figures of the Bible confront God and ask him to be truly God and show his lordship through his grace and forgiveness. I mean, we think about Abraham arguing on behalf of the people, um, for the people of Sodom at the end of Genesis 18, uh, and then the denouement at the beginning of Genesis 19, where that community is destroyed. Again, we think of the complaint of Job, something that seems impossible, I think, to imagine inside the canon of the Quran. The actual complaint of Job standing in the whirlwind and requesting God to be, if you like, more dependable in his message as a just and good God. This might appear as presumption to Muslims, the idea of Job challenging God about the problem of innocent suffering. What's interesting about that book, of course, is the fact that it's canonized at all. I mean, Job's real sin is his self-righteousness, uh, which might be interpreted as an inability to see the limits of self-justification. Sometimes people have to stop just self-justifying. And Job obviously doesn't know when to draw the line, as it were. As a Muslim, I actually regard the book of Job as subversive of Hebrew ethics. And I'd be very happy if there's any Old Testament Job scholars. I'd love to have a debate with them on this occasion, um, if somebody thinks that that's not the case. So the idea that there's a perfect if rather simplistic alignment of virtue and prosperity on the one hand and vice and unhappiness in this world is very ably questioned by the brilliant writer of the book of Job. And of course, Christians and Muslims agree that we do need another world to rectify the errors in the moral administration of this world. I think that's a sen sentiment that is implicit both in the Lord's Prayer in a mild way and much more openly in the Fatiha, the the, the Quranic equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, and Surah number one. I should add here, by the way, that the problem of innocent suffering is a major anchorage of Pauline soteriology, of Paul's notion of salvation, about what might be called the redemptive, the redemptive role of innocent suffering, a theme that probably uh, is likely to find more sympathy with, um, um, say, Shiite Islam, and other forms of Islam in the marginalia of Sunni orthodoxy. But nonetheless, uh, there is certainly a place for that kind of reasoning in interfaith theology. But I regard that as fundamentally a Christian thing. The second thing that strikes me as being very extraordinary about the, about the Bible is that 
Theodicy, the problem of evil, theodicy, the notion of justifying to man the ways of God, is actually covered in some detail in the very first book of Genesis, uh, the very first book of the Bible. And it is remarkable that this problem, which is among the most enduring sources of the rejection of ethical monotheism in the modern secularized world, is not addressed in the Quran, and even more remarkably, is not addressed by any significant Muslim thinker. The problem of evil, the theodicy, if you like. Perhaps somebody might want to challenge me and come up with the name of some obscure medieval thinker who has written a small tract on it, but I say significant Islamic thinker. It seems to be something that doesn't register on the radar of Muslim thought, either in the Quran, or more interestingly perhaps, inside the theology that developed from it. In other words, um, one of the reasons why I think Islam does not have a tradition of what might be called conscientious atheism, conscientious being the opposite of the fashionable, uh, is that um, neither the Islamic tradition nor the Islamic revelation seem to regard it as a problem, the fact that there's evil in the world. It seems like a very curious omission, and I find it very dramatically present uh, both in the Bible and in the work of, say, someone like... Um, <clears throat> The late John Hick, whose very powerful book, Evil and the God of Love, examined theodicy. Well, perhaps John Hick is a bad example, because I think some Christians doubt whether he was a Christian or not. Uh, but certainly his book is a very powerful examination of, if you like, the conflict between the idea of a powerful God, a powerful and merciful God, who nonetheless tolerates evil. Uh, if he's incapable of stopping the evil, then he's not omnipotent. And if he doesn't want to, for some other reason, Maybe there's a mysterious reason, but on the surface at least, there seems to be some ground to the secular accusation that, uh, <clears throat> that if God is omnipotent, he can prevent evil, and if he can prevent it but doesn't, then either he's evil or more likely he doesn't exist at all. I'm sure you're familiar with this type of syllogism if you've done elementary philosophy of religion. So as I say, by contrast with these omissions, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing may be debated, omissions from the Islamic revelation and the Islamic tradition, by contrast, as I say, both in the Bible itself, Genesis 3 to 9, 3 to 9 for example, there's lots of material about the fall of mankind, about Noah and the flood, and about God's reaction to human disobedience and evil. None of this is registered, it seems to me, in the Islamic tradition, either in the Revelation or in those people who have thought about this. Before I end my reflection on this alleged omission, I want to add that, conversely, unlike the Bible, it seems to me that the Quran mentions as part of its revelation a certain interesting problem that is only addressed in post-biblical Christian theology. Although there are embryonic hints of it in Paul's epistle to the Romans, and that is that the Quran actually pontificate, pontificates inside its own canon on the moral question of the justice of God in ensuring the universality of revealed guidance. In other words, this matter is debated in Christian theology and exegesis, but not in scripture. Christian theology, not Christian scripture, has to countenance this problem of the Jew Gentile divide. As I say, there are hints of it in Paul and Galatians as well as Romans, but the proper discussion that occurs in form of human reflection on the problem, which is how is it that we have a two-tier two system of salvation with Israel first and its salvation first, followed by the salvation of the rest of the human race. Now this is a problem for Christian theology and the Quran dismisses the very formulation of this problem as a racist libel against God, that that was never the case. In other words, true that God elected Israel, I think there's Quranic evidence for that, that is his grace, that is his grace. But he also ensured simultaneously guidance for all human beings, that is his justice. In other words, only an unjust type of favor amounts to favoritism. Perhaps I can give an example from the uh, from the Bible, in the New Testament, think of the Matthew's parable of the workers hired at different times of the day in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16, which ends with the enigmatic comment, the last will be first and the first will be last. 
In other words, the Gentiles can be saved as Gentiles if we use vocabulary alien to the Quran. Although, of course, we have some technical equivalents of the notion of the Gentiles, Ummiyun, people who are unscriptured. But nonetheless, this formulation of Gentiles as people who do not have guidance and must wait until Israel has been saved and until this intricate extension of the Jew-Gentile division using Paul's arguments vis-a-vis -vis the, the Abrahamic mandate. As I say, the very formulation of this problem is prohibited in the Quran as a racist libel against the dignity and reputation of God. So I wanted to just begin by saying that <clears throat> what I find interesting as, a, as somebody who does not share the inspiration, at least not completely, of the Christian scriptures is that I think that what Muslims regard as the human element in the Christian revelation is precisely what Christians might see as either the source of its theology or actually theological reasoning in itself because of the amalgam of the human theological reasoning with the pure divine oracles of revelation. This is a model of revelation which is foreign to the Quran and to the Muslim mind. I want to now focus a bit more uh, precisely on what I've actually learned during my writing the commentary on Paul's epistle to the Galatians. I'm in the very odd position of somebody who does Christian theology but is not a Christian. It is safe to assume that a theologian must believe in the faith whose doctrines he or she expounds. Although I must admit the relaxed orthodoxy of certain Oxford Anglican theologians makes one doubt this axiom. <coughs> Can I have a bit of water? I I would be oh, yeah, thanks. Of course, England's strict libel laws prevent one from naming anyone. <laughs> <clears throat> one of the reasons I feel I'm entitled to do this is because I actually regard exegesis as a part of the philosophy of religion, not a part of theology. If people want to debate that rather controversial stance in the answer and question session, I'd be very happy to do so. I'll simply assert it as part of my method. In looking at Galatians, I'm very lucky in that we have, of course, no issues about the canonicity of Galatians. It's a very stable text, very few textual variants, unlike, let's say, the Acts of the Apostles, which has a, a history of greater instability in the text. Um, and as a Muslim, we tend to deal with canonical texts only in terms of wanting to write commentaries on it. So I'm glad that I don't have any issues with that. Uh, the, in fact, the canonicity of Galatians is axiomatic. It's used to measure the alleged uh, candidates for canonicity among the other more disputed, for example, Deuteropoline uh, epistles like Colossians and Ephesians. So I can assume the textual integrity of the text of a rival scripture uh, for purposes of my work. Now this leads to a preliminary problem, which is that as a Muslim, I must suspend the Quranic view about tahrif or tabdil, the idea of the alleged corruption of the Christian scriptures. I suspend belief in that. And this suspension permits me to explore the Bible as an autonomous rival scripture. The reason I do that is so that I can actually examine the empirical variety and diversity of Christianity. Obviously, I can't do that if I assume ab initio a certain view about what true Christianity or normative Christianity is. In other words, if I didn't adopt this suspension stance, I would be in effect from the very start, dispossessing Jews and Christians of their rich, faithful heritage. Christians, of course, in the case of Galatians, but I meant of the entire Bible, Jews and Christians. I would be dispossessing them of their faith, faithful heritage, which is very rich. And I think I would make them feel that they've not been understood. In other words, that I'm dealing with a caricature of their faith rather than with their faith. It's my ambition, in other words, to be able to contribute something to New Testament scholarship in a way that New Testament scholars would recognize it as a genuine attempt, shows intellectual patience with the text, and is not merely a polemical thing. I should add, by the way, that Muslims have been very happy to use the findings of critical biblical scholarship in polemical contexts, but no Muslim, as to my knowledge, contributed to the actual body of New Testament scholarship in terms of a, a detailed a textual criticism, <clears throat> which can be taken seriously by Christians. In other words, for someone like me, a Muslim, a very instructive Muslim witticism, which is very popular, is not something that can ever guide my research, which is, you have the cross, but we have the Christ. <laughs>
You have the cross, but we have the Christ. It's very popular in many Muslim circles. As I say, a very powerful slogan, <clears throat> and in some sense, religiously required for me to believe, but as part of my method when I'm writing on the New Testament, I suspend that kind of conviction. Following on from that, I believe that one must always use a principle of charity in interpreting a rival faith's scriptural doctrines. What do I mean by principle of charity? I think that I'm under an obligation to seek the internal coherence of the doctrines I examine as best as I can. If, of course, at the, if at the end of the examination of a patient and scrupulous examination, it, occur, it occurs to me that it is in fact an in, 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 inconsistent or incoherent doctrine, one is obliged to say that. But I think there's a guiding principle of method. One should do one's best to seek the internal coherence of the doctrine one is examining. And this is a, a greater obligation when the scripture belongs to a rival. Um, in other words, avoid assuming that the Bible understood properly points towards the truth of a rival scripture such as the Quran. So I do not read it with that in mind. I should add incidentally that um, it may be in bad taste to say this, but the late Kenneth Craig, with whom I had many uh, published uh, <coughs> exchanges, I think he was, he made a major mistake when he argued that an internal examination of the logic of Islam's confession, Allahu Akbar, the greatness of God, requires the incarnation. Now that may be one's theological position at the end as a terminus, it obviously cannot be something that guides one work, one's work because it then implies that <clears throat> you're using the rival scripture essentially in a polemical way rather than giving it what might be called an autonomous integrity uh, with some degree of respect for its authority in its own right. Before I talk a bit about what I've actually learned from Paul during my uh, work on Galatians, let me say that for some people, I think doing a commentary can be a covert form of doing theology, including, unfortunately, polemical theology. I think Karl Barth is the best, exa best example of that. Um, so that uh, a commentary can be a hidden form of theology, uh, and theology here being used in a more ideological sense of having some hidden, hidden agenda behind it. <clears throat> what am I doing for time? Uh, I don't Oh, that's fine. So I've got lots of thank you. So I want to move on now to what I've actually learned from Paul during my uh, last few years of examining uh, Galatians. When I first arrived in Oxford, um, I had a very vague idea that I wanted to do something on Paul. Um, the reason was because of some autobiographical incidents in my life um, that led me to wonder about how Paul was able to um, make uh, Christianity into a truly universal religion. Remember, he's appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles, so he's moving outside the Jewish context. And the reason it was partly of interest to me, but autobiographically, was because being a non-Arab Muslim, being a Muslim of Pakistani origin, I had experienced um, I suppose it might, one might call it a degree of racism when I was in the International Islamic University in Malaysia. Um, and um, it occurred to me that this is a very peculiar situation because, of course, Islam inside the Quran from the very beginning, even in the Meccan division, when it's not a political faith, seemed to be a universal message. Uh, and yet, uh, its Arabic stamp could hardly be denied. I mean, after all, the Quran itself very proudly proclaimed in uh, Anzal Nahu, Quran in Arabian, we have sent it down as an Arabic Quran, la lakum taqilun, for the very functional reason that this is the way in which perhaps you might understand it. Inevitably, scripture must be in a language. No language is sacred in the sense that it is simultaneously a human language, even though it may be employed in a sacred context. And yet I was finding that um, uh, the Arab Muslims with whom I worked in the faculty thought of themselves not as adherents, adherents of Islam, but as its patrons. So they felt that people who were not Arab Muslims had perhaps a, a, were not necessarily capable of the same degree of piety or taqwa that they were. This was an unspoken uh, view, but it seemed to me obvious. So it was in this context, I should add, that I began to be interested in reading the origins, Christian origins, and how it was that Paul, uh, more or less single-handedly, I don't want to exaggerate his role in the early church, managed to make um, the new Christian movement a universal religion. So that was the um, autobiographical background to why I became interested in it. <clears throat> 
Orwell, George Orwell once wrote in a journalistic piece that, quote, every life is a failure from the inside. I wonder how many of you agree with that and wonder what people think of that. Every life is a failure from the inside. What he meant by that is that <clears throat> we all know secretly where we have failed. But for example, this is my own explanation of all that. When we compile our CV, it would be odd if somebody compiled a CV of their failures rather than of their successes. <clears throat> Everyone is a failure from the inside, says Orwell. I think here when I read Paul towards the very end, of what we might call the psychological stigmata that marks and mars many human lives. Paul, of course, is the apostle who teaches Christians how to discern strength inside weakness. You know, at the very end of Galatians in chapter 6, Paul talks about the stigmata, the, the, the wounds or the signs of Christ. I'm saying that if we would extend that into a modern secular context, I dis debate this question in some depth in the final uh, chapter of my rather long commentary on Paul. But I always think that Paul actually speaks to certain issues within the larger secular condition, not just to people who are people of other faiths. So that's one of the things that I have learned from reading Paul. What can Muslims learn from Paul? If I wanted to put it in the form of a slogan, I'd say that they can learn from Paul that people of the book, yes, but do not become slaves of the book. And what do I mean by that? Slaves of the book. People of the book, Ahl al-Kitab. A Quranic description of the scriptured communities of Jews and Christians intended incidentally as a compliment but it's not absolutely clear whether that is the self-image of Jews and Christians. I mean, I suspect that um, Jews see themselves as people of the Holy Land, a land that is so sacred that every mitzvah performed in Jerusalem particularly has greater merit and sanctity than performed elsewhere in the diaspora. And I suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, the Christian self-image is as the people of grace, of Christ's grace, rather than people of a book, such as people of the Bible. Yet, as I say, the Quran intends it as a compliment. Um, so, be people of the book by all means, but not slaves of the book. What does that mean? It seems to me that <clears throat> at one level it's merely religious common sense that formalism and empty ritual are a great threat to real introspective spirituality, which obviously requires sincerity and interiority of motive. I don't think that's an original point, and I don't think any Muslim or Jew for that matter would disagree with Paul on that. It's a salutary reminder, of course, especially with certain sects of Islam. By the way, we are also have Muslim Pharisees. Did you know that? Salafis, for example, and some Wahhabis probably are in that category. Muslim Pharisees. The word Pharisee here not being used pejoratively, but simply people who are very concerned about the rituals and the etiquette of law. As I say, there can be a perfectly legitimate attachment to law, and Islam is a law-centered religion, but Paul's warning would be about the emptiness of the ritual. As I say, not necessarily an original message. It's probably just religious common sense. But what I find in Paul to be more important in this context is this point that the unexamined life, the life of the flesh, with its dynamic bias towards evil and wrongdoing, that life is not worth living. That that's the glory of the human creature, the ability to reflect what is reflected in the demands and the imperatives of the spirit. And Paul, I think, would be cheered up to know that Socrates agrees with him. <laughs> In this context, it seems to me that one of the lacuna, one of the gaps in modern Islam is that there's no developed and independent theory of ethics, a theory of the good life. In other words, all one has is a very highly articulate, very sophisticated legal discourse, part of which is inherited and part of which is now being created afresh in terms of the minority status that Muslims have and of course someone like Professor, Professor Tariq Ramadan has asked Muslims to develop a 
a fiqh or a jurisprudence that reflects the minority condition of Muslims in Europe. It's a very worthy enterprise. But the larger philosophical problem behind it, which might be called the moralization of law, in other words, what's the ethical basis of the law, is not something that is traditionally been a part of Islam. And I believe that this stage, not any earlier, but this particular stage in, in the history of Islam, this is a salutary reminder that we do need an ethical framework for the law. Not to say that the law needs to be done away with, I don't assume any radical Pauline position on this, but that there should be a very clear understanding of what might be legitimately called the ethical spirit of the law. But this, the law remains, but the ethical spirit of it needs to be clarified. How do Muslims react to some of what I'm saying here? How would they react to these lessons that I've learned from Paul? I've given you a very brief summary of things. Obviously, there's a lot more I could say, but I think there's en enough of that. But what I, wa I want to be able to say to you is, how do Muslims react to that? One of the great dangers in doing um, interfaith work <clears throat> is that often the type of Muslim who's attracted to that is rather a maverick figure on the margins of his own community and does not necessarily belong. I think it's very important when making these proposals in interfaith work, interfaith theology included, that one carries one's community with oneself, and so that there's a larger attempt to gain the sympathy rather than just individuals gathering to talk about esoteric themes. So from the Muslim point of view, <clears throat> I think that the reservations which I share are that in some ways a law-free faith is a regression towards what I call a more mythological or mystical stage of religion. So although Christians think that the moving away from the law and towards a more spirit-based religion is a progress, I think that Muslims with some justification would see it as a regression towards a more primitive stage of religion. Um, and I, I'm just putting forward the idea, and I defend this thesis in my, in my written work, but I'd be very happy if anyone wants to challenge me in the question and answer session why I think this. Of course I accept the appeal of freedom, especially today, and I understand our dislike of ritual inflexibility and of uh, ritual rigidity. It's very easy, for example, to mock the Muslim Pharisees, the, the Salafis, for example, who are very concerned about the minutiae of Islamic etiquette regarding, let's say, prayer, for example. But I think that the lesson to be learned from Paul is not the rejection of protocol, which is necessary when you are appearing before a majestic king to pray to him, but that the spirit of it, the sincerity behind it, not a disputed thesis either, it seems to me, I think, that most Muslims would agree with that. <clears throat> the more difficult issue is how does one prevent freedom from becoming license? This is, I think, a very central modern problem. Um, that perhaps Christians and Muslims can agree on. Where I think Muslims need to do some work is to avoid slandering the people of the gospel and say, for example, in the vilification of Paul, that, oh, Paul preached, you can do whatever you like, you can break the law, you can sin as much as you want because you've been saved. We know that's a caricature of what Paul says. So if, in terms of the fact that the future of the people of Islam will be a future with the people of the gospel, I think it is a matter of justice not to begin by slandering people by attributing views that they do not hold. Overall, in my summary of Paul's views on the law, I would say that <clears throat> Paul makes a correct point about the limits of the law, the salvific limits of the law, but that he exaggerates that point. And in particular, I believe that Paul misunderstood the, the purpose of the law, because the law was not meant to ensure salvation. That was not its purpose. So there seems to be, for me as a Muslim commentator, as I say, unlike perhaps orthodox uh, Christian commentators, I'm not obliged to agree with everything. And although writing a commentary, although writing a commentary presupposes a degree of reverence for the author, whether the author is human or divine, remember people write commentaries on Plato with a lot of reverence, I think the one as a commentator reserves the right to be critical of that. <clears throat> I just have one further major point. I did I have enough time for one further major, for about, do I have another five minutes? Yeah. I do have five or ten minutes? Five? 
or ten? Yeah, okay, that'll be perfect. I, you know, I put here on my notes, time permitting, because I wasn't sure how much I'd be able to say, but this is the last uh, thing that I want to say, which is what can Muslims and Christians mutually learn from each other in reading each other's scriptures? I want to um, broaden the focus slightly. I think that <clears throat> there's two areas in which we can learn. One is about the doing of theology, and the other one is about the area of politics, where we can agree and have a consensus about certain issues. So let me begin by the question of theology. Earlier on I said that Islam has no theology. Let me just qualify that statement and in the context of Christian theology make, make clear what I mean by that. So you might think of this as uh, an initial debate about comparative theology. Islamic theology, insofar as it exists, is relatively concrete in my view, rather than metaphysical or mystical. The reason being they deal with God's nature only marginally, only insofar as this nature affects his moral and legal will for human beings. In other words, the Quran does not speculate about the nature of God. I believe that one advantage of this concreteness is that it prevents Islamic theology from being co-opted or annexed to any purely ideological theology, such as liberation theology, black theology, feminist, environmentalist variants. People I'm sure are familiar with that from the experiences of Christian theology, which I believe has been annexed in that way. So while Islam contains notions obviously of liberation and justice, these are not part of its theology but of its legal system. Not of its theology, but of its legal system. So the two can be kept separate. The result of this is that I think that Islam offers concrete opposition to secularism. This is an area where I think Christians can learn from Muslims. I believe that Islam offers concrete opposition to secularism, a real political confrontation, rather than an abstract accommodative theology which is elastic enough to move away from the divine will for us, namely to be a just and peaceful society that reflects godly ideals both on this side of the grave and not merely as a deferred ne nemesis in the next world. And that is why, of course, as you know, Islam in its law has bans on, let's say, alcohol and usury, a very important thing in our current economic climate. And more positively, it has canonical requirements about fasting and praying and giving alms to, purif to purify wealth. I believe that such duties and bans are a direct challenge to Western capitalist and materialist secularism, rather than merely a verbal challenge couched as reflective theology. It is praxis, not theology. It's a resistance movement, in other words, not merely a school of social criticism. I don't want to stereotype Christians and say all Christians would disagree. I'm sure there are many Christians, in, especially Catholics, who are interested in social justice. I believe that we can work together on some of these issues of ethical consensus. But if we want a realistic basis for that ethical consensus, let us be clear about what is the theological background and where our differences are in that theology. In the area of politics, I believe that... Um, the Christian notion that utopian idealism can appeal only to people on the margins, to an abject minority, if you like, is one that Islam rejects and opts instead for the view that political participation can be universal, not restricted to a minority on the margins. It can be ethical. It can even be sacred, as indeed it has been once in Islam's utopia, the political providence of God in Medina. But what Muslims can learn from the New Testament, from Paul and from Christians who are sincere advisors, is that such political power must remain a means to an end. And the end is the kingdom of God on earth. Thank you.